On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumnus, Dr. John Schweitzer, to address convocation. Mr. Patton, thank you for your generous encomia. And of course, bonjour again, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, distinguished faculty, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the mid 20th century. This greeting is my official mantra of welcome to my home in Montreal. Why, you may ask, let me explain. As a visual artist who has lived without 21st century survivalist techno toys, i.e. no computer, mobile phone, Crackberry, and the like, sans auto, without car, with a vintage Olivetti typewriter, a telecopier with untried bells and whistles, and a bicycle with two flat tires housed in a storage unit. I am a walking testament. Yes, I do stress the walking part. To the virtues of neo-Ludditism. In my case, not necessarily raging against technology, as the, the original British Luddites were wont to do, but following the penchant of my axial right brain I'm simply convinced of the innate lack of poetry in these contemporary tools. However, an echt neo-Luddite would decry all virtues of this digital age. Yet quite ironically, I do not spurn the technology, but rather embrace it as a concept of course. I marvel at the organizational and research possibilities of search engines, and I'm always awestruck at the rapacious speed with which my editor makes additions to my ever-mutating resume. Here's the caveat. I am an apologist of what I like to call the dirty fingernail theory, subscribing to the notion that an authentic artist manipulates real materials, charcoal, paint, glue, and the like, and the vestiges of this creative act bear witness. Art is thereby closely aligned with craftsmanship or fabrication. Even my name, Schweitzer, as a German translation of the welder, bespeaks what many may deem to be a reactionary sensibility in the often precious and rarefied arena of contemporary art where no evidence of the process of making is apparent. Quite frankly, virtual reality is of no relevance to my artistic practice. Allow me to indulge now in a Proustian moment. No Madeleines here, but a vial of turpentine transports me now to my childhood. Christmas Eve, 1958. I still remember the rapture of unwrapping Santa's gift. How knowing. John Nagy's Learn to Draw kit, the boxed version based upon his how-to art lessons for amateur artists featured on black and white television, no less. I could scarcely contain my excitement, uncapping the bottle of turpentine to enjoy its pungent odor fondling the charcoal sticks and the gum eraser with an almost erotic fervor. A true epiphany for this prepubescent youth. My childhood years were spent in glorious solitude. My conscious choice as the only son with two sisters who are present today, giving free reign to my imagination. Occasional intrusions of the outside world beyond Jericho, Ontario. Population 50, at best if one included the animals. 
were welcome, but not necessarily de rigueur. I do, however, recall the weekly delivery of Time magazine, the international edition no less, by a stalwart traveling salesman. Yes, indeed, Willie, Willie Lohman did exist in the 1950s. And in frequent visits to the dentist in the neighboring metropolis of Delhi, population 5,000, afforded me the singular pleasure of reading The New Yorker in Dr. Brown's waiting room, undoubtedly the only paid subscription in Norfolk County. I subsequently befriended Mrs. Nancy Brown, the dentist's wife, in later years, who informed me that she actually worked with the humorist James Thurber at the Manhattan office of the magazine. Ergo, six degrees of urbanity. These two childhood incidents were emblematic of an ever-expanding universe, and I mimetically grew with it. Little Johnny became not quite Big John physically, yet perhaps the biggest spurt of growth occurred mentally, as my idea of the self and the possibilities within this planet exploded fractally. My nascent Weltanschauung, or worldview, had been unleashed. So here's life lesson number one. Cue in the grating sound of chalk on slate. Remain a perennial student. Be curious about your world and the world. Do not restrain and thereby restrict your interests to your career. Develop Catholic small c interests that will rhythmatically complement your métier. Consider a vocation in life, one that allows or even requires an approach of polysemous pluralism, or even better, an omnivorous predisposition of passion. Predictably, you will consume professional journals in, or, in order to stay au courant. Yet seek out as well ancillary arcana beyond your field in order to, to feed, inspire, and innovate. In extremis, the literal consumption of the ill-fated book is not suggested. Mastication of paper, as in Peter Greenaway's film The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover, should be avoided unless in dire circumstances, such as concealing a pin number under duress. A better strategy might be found at the local library or magazine stand, or dare I suggest, online via extensive search engines that reveal the open-endedness of any inquiry. Yet research uber alles, both a noun and a verb, this quest should burn in intensity, an almost visceral motivation. My Ludditism aside, like a vision from Truffaut's cinematic masterwork, Fahrenheit 451, every individual here in this hall has the capacity to carry hundreds of books accessible 24-7 in e-books such as Kindle and Kobo. We've come full circle from the 16th century elitist stance of the public intellectual with his handbooks or enchiridions to the new world of the nanosecond virtual library. Knowledge is no longer simply power, but democratic and accessible to all. Your liberal education at Western should be viewed as a metaphorical tremplin, or diving board, facilitating mental gymnastics, or soubresaut, somersaults of skilled reasoning. The Faculty of Arts and Humanities, for example, maintains a strong commitment to such interdisciplinary or parallel academic leaping. In today's accelerated global network, connecting the dots, or, quote, making connections, 
as philosopher John Reichman advocates, is crucial to your success in life. And speaking personally once again, this rhizomatic approach that is a central stalk with tendrils reflects what I like to call the organic education of the artist. How do artists learn? How does one teach the artist? Puzzling conundra, given the oft-quoted turn of phrase, art cannot be taught or learned, only absorbed by a quasi-mystical combination of osmosis and raw talent, an inescapably solitary activity of self-expression. Yet, I maintain that ineffable talent is not enough. Volition, or as the abstract expressionist painter Hans Hofmann decreed, quote, inner necessity assures success. This same principle governs all career choices. The taste or need to succeed, albeit defined differently by every novitiate, requires omnipresent salivation. Pregnant pause. Cheers. Yes, buccal juice. Only fire burning brightly, as British transcendentalist poet and painter William Blake called it, can assure salvation of the mind and heart. Lofty issues indeed to speak of in this final week of October 2011, yet of topical relevance to you graduands embarking on your invitation au voyage into the nebulous and indeterminate real world. But there are assuredly certain givens to assuage your anxieties amidst this amorphous spectacle of multiple choice known as the professional world outside. A few wise words to preface, not mine. Quote, an unexamined life is not worth living, proclaimed Socrates. Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, insisted Rene Descartes of the Enlightenment. Your liberal arts education is more valuable today as we barrel toward a knowledge-based economy. Fundamental questions without big answers are raised in this Socratic symposium cum university. Who am I? Why am I here? What is beauty, virtue, justice? The investigation of such aesthetic, philosophical, and ethical issues is, however, the prologue to this endless narrative known as the humanities. Quite unlike the sciences, where one apprehends the how with the absolute certainty of the Cartesian left brain, the study of humanities together with the social and information sciences invokes the question, why? Learning in this context is synonymous with searching, a marvelous quest within an historical literary context. Magical thinking, indeed, to quote Joan Didion. So, life lesson number two, Etan moi, astonish me, baited French surrealist Jean Cocteau. View your life as a mission to marvel and be marveled, les merveilles. Just getting by limits your ambition to the ranks of the pedestrian. Mediocrity is an anesthetizing panacea of sorts. But to be original, innovative, stellar, now there's a testosterone-charged challenge. Self-worth is based upon self-respect, and one is defined in some way by what one does. However, put ego aside in order to try. Trying means pushing beyond the proverbial envelope, thinking beyond the conventional cube. That's art speak with a Cezanne-esque twist. The overarching ambition of a liberal education is never in question. Free citizens need to develop their minds 
as opposed to simply acquiring marketable skills to enjoy meaningful lives of intangible reward. Especially in this digital age, students must acquire analytic ac acumen through social curiosity and engagement, broadening and challenging the mind in order to communicate persuasive arguments in a culture of entropic vacuity and questionable materialism. Technology mutates with innovation. Critical thinking is a life skill. Therefore, cultural literacy, both verbal and visual, together with a plastic or malleable mindset, are prerequisites for your success in this pragmatic global village. Riddled with a certain cultural amnesia, we have seemingly overlooked Aristotle's simple prescription for happiness. Quote, humans are, by their very nature, creatures who need to know. Volition rears its fortuitous head once again. In keeping with this Aristotelian construct, Aristotelian construct, I hereby propose Schweitzer's dictum for self-fulfillment. Drum roll, s'il vous plaît. The third and final life lesson. But first, an aside. When the late cultural theorist Northrop Fry of the University of Toronto visited my Montreal studio in the late 20th century, 1990 to be exact, he was smitten by an abstract gouache on paper consisting of only two lines, one vertical, the other horizontal, floating on an ambiguous field of charcoal gray. Upon closer inspection, he exclaimed with delight, "Ah!" There's the line of beauty, referring to the black vertical band with collage. This sinuous line prompted an elliptical response from Nori as he made a salient connection. To him and to me, this vertical passage evoked a lyrical response as the line grew heavenward from the horizon. In homage to our rencontre, I retitled the work A Lyric for Northrop, which, by the way, will become part of the Schweitzer Holdings of the University in 2012, my gift to mark the centenary of collage. Lengthy aside, notwithstanding, I revert to my final life lesson. Think vertically and horizontally. Lateral thinking is not enough. Do not discount the merits of your EQ emotional quotient amidst the linearity of the rational horizon. Even better, if your intuition dictates, follow the oblique road, move the grid, believe in the sanctity of the serendipitous. As Louis Pasteur advised, chance favors the prepared mind. We apostles of the humanities and social sciences are thankfully predisposed to such lyrical thinking, as we recognize and are sustained by the poetic and illusory possibilities inherent in living on this ever-expandable and shrinking galaxy. Such binary oppositions will abound and confound your lives. My collage ethos revels in such improbable juxtapositions and felicitous encounters of chance. Yet your career trajectory, linear though it may appear to be at the outset, will be subverted and tested by unexpected and unwelcome challenges that will threaten to, to derail your démarche. As Marcus Aurelius prescribed, is your cucumber bitter? Throw it away. Are there briars in your path? Turn aside. That is enough. Use bad luck as a rationale for self-compassion. It's enough that the deities and furies are plucking at your innards. Frame bad luck as a call to action. Misfortune is not a reason to play dead, nor wish that one was. When our luck is challenged, 
we can least afford to be delinqu delinquent in our allocation of time or careless about our resources. Carpe diem, seize the day in order to prepare for better fortune or perhaps new vocational options. To survive these unexpected and untoward setbacks should inspire us to even greater heights of self-knowledge, self excuse me. Cross the Rubicon. The celestial ring awaits those who dare and do. Now, the painful return to Earth following this Miltonian and at times apologetically aleatory address. Loose ends abound, so allow me to summon the spirits of my ill-used left brain to bring a certain logic to this labyrinth. Back to the future as the pundits pitch. My introductory salutation, welcoming you all to the mid-20th century, is an, apol is an apolo apologia, excuse me, of sorts, to the halcyon days of my youth as a child of the 1950s. Moreover, the greeting evokes the wellsprings of my artistic inspiration, the New York School, l'Ecole de Paris, les automatistes du Québec, the seminal roots of my inspiration. Nostalgia aside, utopian design, idealism, not to mention the heroic aspirations of the post-war period, all figure in this romanticized stream of consciousness that is the mid-20th century. However, the greatest influence of my formative years is here at Western. The university has always represented the genesis of my career. When this small town boy enrolled here in 1970, I still recall the incandescent sense of belonging, one that valorized the arts and embraced individualism. Summarily, my trajectory as both an artist and philanthropist is predicated upon the ideological latitude of this enlightened community. Since hearing of the news of this honor, I've often quipped to family and friends Honorary degrees are often accorded to elderly curmudgeons or those on the brink of death. Viewing the youthful and vivacious recipients at this autumn convocation, I retire this theory. Tant pis. Accepting this Doctor of Laws degree, honoris causa, Mr. President, is singularly the most unequivocal stance I've taken in my 59 years. And for this, I thank you. And I thank Western. Bravo, chapeau.